Commission. I know that um, Commissioner Mulaisi is present, Commissioner Marco, Commissioner Mkolotela, as well as Commissioner Nkapa. Welcome to all of you. I welcome also the media that are here to hear our report. And without wasting much time, I'll go ahead and um, share the report with you. I also want to thank the technical team that assists us, our colleagues from the department, Nzwaki and your team, Dadim Kalibi, thank you for always supporting us and helping us in our work as a commission. Colleagues, let me start off by giving you an overview of what we will cover in this report. As I go through this presentation, I'll talk very briefly about the nationally, national economically active population. I'll then go on and talk about the trends on all occupational levels. I'll focus on race, on gender, and then just briefly on transactional, uh, the intersectionality of gender and race. I'm also going to talk very briefly about the impact of COVID-19 on the implementation of employment equity, and then share some key observations about the report and just way forward from us as a commission. Moving on then to the national EAP in terms of race and gender, clearly you can see at the bottom that it indicates that 25, I mean 55.4% of the EAP is male while 44.6% is female. The African population makes up 79.3%, whilst the colored, colored population makes up 8.9%. The Indian population makes 2.8%, while the white population makes up only 9% of the EAP. I'd like you all, please, including our media, to keep this in mind when we reflect on what the labor market looks like currently in terms of race, as well as in terms of gender. I'm going to go ahead without wasting too much time to talk about what it looks like at top management. So this, this is a meeting is being of, recorded. This is a reflection of what we look like in terms of top management, which is the top level of organizations in corporate South Africa, as well as in the public sector. What we are seeing, the picture is showing us that 15.8% of the population is made up of Africans. Colored, may, colored population make up 5.7%, while the Indian population makes up 10.6%. And you'll remember that when I shared the EAP, I said the Indian population makes up just over 2% of the EAP. And yet at top management, we see that they represent 10.6%. The white population, which represents around 9%, of the EAP at top management is at 64.7%. So clearly all of us can see that they're highly overrepresented in terms of this occupational level. It's also interesting to note that foreign nationals represent 3.1% of top management. And we know that this is usually reflected by multinationals who bring in their own executives to sit in our country and head up their organizations. I also want to reflect on the trend analysis. You'll see that we've done a trend analysis 2018 to 2020. And even as you look at it, you will notice that the shift to the designated groups from the white population group is very slow. And in fact, the trend that we've been seeing over the years is a one percentage point increase in favor of designated groups. So if I use the African population as an example, 2018, they made up 15.1% of top management. And in 2020, they are making up only 15.8%, which means in the past three years, we've only had a 0.7 percentage point increase in favor of the African population. But together, the African colored and Indian population, we've only seen a favor of about 1% de increase while the decrease has been from the white population. So this is what we look like in 2020 at top management in terms of race. Let us move and see what we look like in terms of gender. If we look at the gender statistics, you will realize that females make up 24.9%, around 25% of top management. And the shift 
from 2019 has just been 0.5%. The growth of the female population at top management is really slow. What you see in terms of race is really the same as how it looks in terms of gender with regards to movement in favor of these designated groups. So as Ms. Mungila has already said, the movement is terribly slow and it, it can become quite discouraging, but we keep on pushing because we cannot stop until we have achieved what is the EAP in terms of the labor market. This slide just shows us um, a representativity in terms of intersectionality. It shows us the movement in terms of each group by race and by gender. So you will see that the African males represent 10.1% at top management. The colored population, colored males represent 3.5%. And you'll see that both the African males and colored, uh, colored males are underrepresented. The blue uh, line that you see there actually shows us the EAP where they should be sitting. And then the other, which is the purple line, really shows us where they're sitting in 2020. So you can see that there's a huge disparity in terms of what the EAP says and where we are in terms of the actual uh, representativity at top management. So you'll see that even colored males are overrepresented. While the Indian males are, sorry, are underrepresented, the colored males are, are underrepresented, while the Indian males are overrepresented, currently sitting at 7.3%. The white males, the EAP is below 10%, but currently they're at 51.6%, whilst the African females population is actually extremely and grossly underrepresented. Same can be said for the colored population, African males, females 5.7, and the colored females 2.2%. The Indian females, as you can see, overrepresented 3.4%, and the white females, overrepresented, 13.1%. Um, I'm not going to talk too much in terms of representativity of foreign nationals, because we're really focusing primarily on designated groups in these slides. Moving on now to senior management, and this is a reflection of what corporate South, I mean, the, the, the labor market looks like in terms of senior management. We see that in 2020, the African population represents 24.7%, colored population 8%, Indian population 11.6%, white population 52.5%, and foreign nationals are still in the 3% region. Again, the white population overrepresented as well as the Indian population, while the African and the colored population are underrepresented. There has been an increase, if you look at a trend analysis of the African population, there's been an increase of 1.2% in favor of the African population at senior management. In terms of gender, the trend remains the same, where the increase is very slow, and it's, it is, in fact, from 2019 to 2020, below the one percentage point mark. In terms of intersectionality by race and gender, we still see, again, that the African males and African females are grossly underrepresented, while the colored population is also underrepresented, both male and female. And the Indian and the white population, both male and female of those groups are overrepresented. I'm now going to move on to the next level, which is the professionally qualified level. This level is often referred to as middle management in common terms. And what we're seeing here is quite a good movement in favor of the African population. You will remember that the EAP of the African population is around 79%. So this looks a little bit more encouraging because the African population is actually sitting at the top in terms of representativity. But if looked at in relation to their EAP, they're still underrepresented. 
currently sitting at 46.7%, while the second highest group would be the white population sitting at 32.1%, overrepresented. Colored population at their AAP, 9.7%, while the Indian population is overrepresented at 9.1%. Foreign nationals are at 2.4%. It's also good to see that the African population has increased by three percentage points between 2019 and 2020. In terms of gender, we also noticed that in terms of gender, um, there is a better representativity of, of, of the female population and it is much more reflective of the EAP. In terms of intersectionality, again, we see the same trend. We see that the African males and the African females are underrepresented. The colored males are actually at their EAP, whilst the colored females are slightly underrepresented. And the other two groups, uh, the Indian, in, in the Indian males and females are overrepresented, as well as the white males and white females overrepresented in terms of their EAP. At this level, it's also encouraging to see that we have the lowest uh, representation of foreign nationals. Currently in 2020, they're sitting at 0.7%. African males are at 22.7%, colored males are at 4.9%. Indian males, 4.8%, white males, 18.2%. African females, 24%. Colored females, 4.8%, Indian females, 4.2%, whilst the white females are at 14%. So that was just a representation in terms of gender and race. Now we move to the next level, which is the skill technical level. And here we're seeing a good trajectory in terms of the representation of the African population. In 2020, the African population represents 63.7% at, at this occupational level. Colored population, 11.6%. Indian population, 5.8%. While the white population is at 17.6%. 17 and foreign nationals, 1.7%. You will see that the increase from 2019 to 2020 has been very slight. 0.5%. And the colored population has, has, has really experienced no increase at this level, at this occupational level. In 2019, there were 11.6, and still in 2020, there's still 11.6. The same can be said for the Indian population, whilst the white population has experienced a very small decline in their numbers. This represents this gives us an indication of representativity by gender. The female population is at 48.8%, while the male population is at 51.2%. This is really a good reflection, very much aligned to the EAP. And this is the intersectionality, which I won't go through in, in a lot of detail by covering the numbers, but less, uh, the least that I can say is that here we still see that the African population is is, is underrepresented and it remains the only uh, population group that is underrepresented in terms of their EAP. This is the semi-skilled level. And we see that at this level, um, the African population is very close. In fact, they're almost at their EAP at 78.6%. With the colored population, um, being at 11.8%, they've exceeded their EAP. The Indian population is at their EAP at 2.5%, whilst the white population is underrepresented at this level at 4.9%. And foreign nationals make up 2.2% of the population. Minister, I need to indicate that at, at, this, at the, this, this level and the level below, this is historically the level at which designated groups have been um, mostly represented because in terms of the job reservations, uh, you know, black people have 
been mostly represented at the lower levels of, of organizations, while management and, and, and junior management levels have really been an area in which um, the roles have been reserved for the white population. So what we're seeing here, even while we celebrate that this represents the EAP, we need to remember that this is really a result of, of the historical legacy of our country. I'm going to now share the statistics in terms of gender at the semi-skilled level. And again, we see quite a good representativity in line with the EAP. And then the next slide is, is um, sharing with us information around the race and gender, uh, with the African males being at 44.4%, the colored uh, males being at 5.6%, Indian males 1.2%, white males 2.1%, African females are still underrepresented, 34.1%, colored females, 6.2%, Indian females, 1.3%, white females, 2.8%, and then the foreign nationals mostly represent by the males. The last slide that talks to the last um, occupational level would be then the unskilled level. We see there that there's an overrepresentation of the African population. And the colored population is just over the EAP at 10.9%, the Indian population 0.7%, while the white population is also underrepresented. So what is happening is that at the unskilled level, we actually see a mirror image of what happens at top management. Um, and it's a reverse of that. Uh, we see an underrepresentation of the white population and the Indian population. With the African population, being mostly represented at this level. And we know that in terms of our economic um, activity, this is the entry level into, into the world of work. And that is why um, we get very concerned when we see numbers that we're seeing of foreign nationals at entry level. This is the level at which people enter the, enter the labor market. And the fact that we're seeing such a high representativity of foreign nationals is concerning to us, Minister because it says to us that job opportunities that should be given to our citizens are more being uh, offered to foreign nationals. And, and we're in our discussions with employers, um, we've heard two types of narratives. The one narrative that we're hearing is that foreign nationals are easier to employ because they would come in and they don't give trouble. They don't cause trouble because you can pay them whatever they, you want to, they will take it. So a lot of the foreign nationals that are at this level um, are really um, exploited. Their rights are not, you know, you know, they are not being honored by their employers. And because they themselves don't know their rights, they tend to keep quiet and are afraid because most of them are not documented. And yet the minute a foreign, a foreign national is employed, they are protected by all labor laws of the country. So despite what employers think, these foreign nationals also have the same rights as our South African citizens have, and they can all seek redress with the CCMA or with the labor court, despite the fact that they may not have the necessary papers. Just being employed uh, gives them the rights that all of us have in terms of the labor relations of our country. So, Minister, this is what uh, what it looks like at a racial at, 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 at um, in terms of race at the unscaled level. Minister and Deputy Minister, this is what we're looking like. And in terms of um, uh, gender, we are seeing that we're more or less representing our, our EAP in terms of gender and in terms of intersectionality. The picture really looks good for designated groups. And it is actually the Indian population primarily, although designated, we know that they dominate uh, with the white people management, the management levels, and at unskilled level, they're really un underrepresented. I'd like to talk about, um, before we close, just to talk about a designated group that is really neglected in, a, in our country, and that is persons with disabilities. If you look at the trend analysis, you will see that movement is Staggeringly slow in these at, at this um, in terms of, of of persons with disabilities. Twenty three years later, in 
of representation. This of meeting is being recorded in the labor market, and this is quite concerning for us as a commission. And I will talk a little bit more about the fact that we've put out a code of good practice, we've put out tags to encourage employers and to guide them around the employment and reasonable accommodation of persons with disability. And we hope that more and more em employers will embrace this and take on uh, persons with disabilities in, into their employ. I said, I promised at the beginning that I would talk to COVID-19, the impact of COVID-19 on employment equity. What we've noticed in this, in this reporting year is that there's been a drop in terms of the number of reports. Um, in fact, the DG received um, 426 EEA for 14 forms, which are forms for application of deregistration as a designated employer. And of these, 360 of them were granted deregistration. And the primary reason for the drop in reporting and the deregistration had to do with the fact that the employers were no longer designated, and this was primarily in the category of uh, turnover threshold. So one can clearly see that uh, COVID-19 has had an economic impact, firstly, on our country, but secondly, it has, an impact, it has had an impact on employment equity in our country. Shortly after the level five lockdown, as a commission, we, we provided guidelines to employers in terms of how to approach employment equity in the light of the reality of COVID-19 and the consequent regulations that came out. And we, in our communication to employers, said the following. We indicated that employers are still obliged to comply with all prov provisions of employment law, even as they restructure due to the impact of COVID-19. We also in indicated that employers should strive to try and, and retain the gains of transformation and try and seek to make sure that they don't lose all of those gains as they seek to uh, retrench a lot of people, in, including primarily the retrenchment of, of, personal, of, of designated groups. And we know that you know, in a lot of other research that has been done in our country, that the people that have suffered the most as a result of COVID-19 and the consequent regulations in terms of employment have been black females, African females primarily. So the face of poverty still remains black females. Thirdly, we reminded employers that they would still have to submit EE reports when the opening period for reporting started in September. We also indicated that those employers that um, whose status had changed as a result of whatever reason, but primarily because of COVID-19, we reminded them that they would have to submit an application to the DG to ensure that they are deregistered in time and remain compliant in terms of the requirements of the Employment Equity Act. So we sent out this communication and we were in constant engagement with employers, some of which were, were sharing with us their stories as a result of COVID-19. It has not been easy for our economy, but we still maintain that employers should do what they need to do and to protect the gains of employment equity and affirmative action. I shared, Minister and, and DM, I shared initially when I spoke about the deregistration that companies that deregistered, deregistered primarily because their turnover thresholds had gone down, that they were now under the threshold for reporting as per their sectors. And what the slide does is really indicate that, because as you can see, employers who employ between zero and 49 people who were designated previously had deregistered. And we see that it was 72.8% of them that deregistered. And it seems the only reason could have been at this stage that it had to do with a, a change in turnover. And it was only 7.8% of the large organizations that deregistered. And whilst those that employ between 
50 and 149 were 19.8%. So this is what the picture is looks like and it tells a story about the impact of COVID-19. As I draw to a close, I just want to share some key observations. It remains clear that top management, the decline of the white population remains slow. It still remains on average over the years, a decline of one percentage point. They are currently sitting at 64.7%. And if the trend is anything to go by, Minister, what it says is that it is going to take us probably another 50 years before we can have a better representation of the EAP and before we can even consider a sunset clause on the, EA, on the Employment Equity Act if top management is anything to go by. I also want to indicate that we have, in the, uh, since the past three years, have had a significant increase of um, representativity of the African population at senior management. For the first time in three years, it's sitting at an increase of 1.2 percentage points, which is very good. There's still an insignificant increase of representativity of women at, at, at sorry, increase at top and senior management. We know that at top management, we had 0.5%, whilst at senior management, we had 0.4%. The professionally qualified level, occupational level paints a very good picture because the African population has increased at this level by 3.5%. And the question still needs to be asked, why is it that there is a, an increase of designated groups and a good, a more or less better representation at middle management. But this is not translating into an increase at senior and top management. Could it be true that there is a glass ceiling for designated groups at middle management? That owners and captains of industry do not trust black people enough to allow them to take the reins and the control of their organizations because real control begins at senior and top management. So this picture is really telling us a, sto a story and it remains concerning for us. The fact that persons with disability are still 1.3% 23 year years later is a great concern to us ministers. And we still want to encourage employers to look at our code, to look at the technical guidelines that we've provided to enable them to gain a better understanding of how the Employment Equity Act uh, positions issues of disability and how to deal with issues of reasonable accommodation. So these are the key observations that I'd like to share. Finally, I'd just like to talk in terms of way forward. What we've learned over the years, over the past 23 years, we have learned one lesson, self-regulation, is not yielding the desired results in as far as transformation of the labor market is concerned. And as a result, we have put out the Amendment Act, the Employment Equity Amendment Act, which is currently in Parliament, to try and expedite transformation in the labor market. The Amendment Bill will empower the minister to put in place sector-specific targets that we believe as a commission and also, as our colleagues uh, believe in the department, that this is really going to be a game changer. We also believe that the issuing of a compliance certificate in terms of the Employment Equity Act is really also going to be a game changer because what it does is that it will stop employers that are non-compliant from doing business with government. And we know that business is in the business of making money. And if you take away the ability to make money unscrupulously, you hit them where it hurts the most, and it will create an incentive to become, for them to implement transformation and to ensure that they become their transformation champions. So that is what the one big change that is out there that we're proposing, Minister. And we're looking forward to the, the enactment of the, the amendment bill that is in place.
We have also in the meantime, as a response to C, the, the convention C-19, revised the, the code of good practice around violence and harassment in the workplace. We've put out a code of good practice on the prevention of, and elimination of all forms of harassment in the workplace. And currently it is in discussion at NEDLEC, the different um, partners are discussing this at NEDLEC and we do believe by March, 2022, it will be out there for employers to start implementing its, its preschools. We look forward to that and we anxiously awaiting that because we recognize that there's still a lot of harassment and a lot of discrimination in the world, of, in, in the workplaces. Minister and DM, that is the presentation of the report. And at this point, I hand over the report to you and um, like to thank you for the time that you've given me to share the highlights of this report. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for presenting the summary of the report. Before we hand over to the Minister to accept the report and make his comments, we just want to encourage our media colleagues to use the chat box for questions so that we can be able to answer on time. And I want to encourage the panelists to either look at the question and answer section of the chat box to see the comments so that we can wrap up with the next session after minister, which is question and answer. Uh, let me allow the minister, uh, minister over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much um, to the program director, the deputy minister of employment and labor, the, the chairperson of the commission for employment equity, the commissioners from the commission for the employment equity, the acting director general, the DDGs who are here and all other officials of the department and members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning to all of you. Chairperson and the commissioners from the Commission for Employment or for Employment Equity, thank you very much for the 21st Employment Equity Annual Report. In reflecting on the chairperson's presentation, it's clear that we still remain a very unequal society, particularly in the upper echelons of our economy. It's clear that this is unacceptable. It is disconcerting to say the least that whilst we consolidate 27 years of democracy, 25 years of our constitution and 23 years of Employment Equity Act, we are still lamenting on the snail's pace of transformation of our labor market. We might have political power, but there's no economic power. The report indicates that apart from the need to achieve racial equity at all levels of our economy, the time has come for us to acknowledge that we have failed both in substance and numbers to address the imbalances of the past in order to uplift the most vulnerable groups in our economy. That is the women and persons with disability. Ladies and gentlemen, we should acknowledge where good progress has been made in relation to the presentation of the designated groups, the black people and women in the economy. This is evident both in terms of race and gender in the middle tiers. And I'm saying emphasize the middle tiers of the, of the workforce, particularly 
the middle management, professionally qualified, and the junior management, that is the skilled technical occupational levels. However, it's very critical to seek answers as to why so insignificant progress is being made in the key strategic occupational levels at the top management and at the senior management occupational levels. Is it because we're not doing enough or is it because there's resistance to transformation? We should all concede that the disturbing trends of transformation reflected in this report calls for an agent change of the mindset, different strategies and actions in order to turn the tide cannot be business as usual. I strongly believe that the time has come to re-strategize and to adopt a different path to ensure that the Employment Equity Act achieves its intended purpose and objectives after 23 years since inception. This report is a wake up call. It's a wake up call to government. It's evident from the data in this report that self-regulation by employers to achieve the objectives of this act has not worked. And more aggressive strategies are required to reach the intended purpose, including the reviewing of the legislation and regulations. And I want to repeat this. To me, it's evident from the data of this report that self-regulation by employers to achieve the objectives of this act has not worked. And more aggressive strategies are required to reach the intended purpose, including reviewing of the legislation and regulations. Therefore, the Employment Equity Amendment B that is currently before Parliament should be seen as a catalyst to expedite the economic transformation of the labor market to address the plight of the most vulnerable groups, that is women and persons with disabilities. So the primary objective of the amendments are to empower the minister to regulate sector specific employment equity targets after consultation of course with the sector stakeholders and on the advice of the commission of employment equity. These sector specific employment targets would serve as progressive milestones or benchmarks towards achieving equitable representation of the designated groups, the black people, women and persons with disabilities across each occupational level of our workforce. In addition, the amendments are intended to promulgate Section 53 of the Employment Equity Act that deals with the issuing of the Employment Equity Compliance Certificate as a prerequisite to access to state contracts or to conduct business with any organ of the state. So the Employment Equity Compliance Certificate is critical in ensuring that financial benefits from the state only accrue to organizations that are committed and willing to contribute to the transformation agenda of this country. Further, the proposed employment equity amendments are also vital in strengthening and enforcing mechanisms of the Employment Equity Act. Therefore, in pursuance of our transformation endeavors, I would like to urge Parliament to finalize the deliberations and the enactment 
of the Employment Equity Amendment Bill so that we are able to build an all-inclusive South Africa. Thank you very much, Commissioners. I accept this report. As I've said, it's a wake-up call. We have to respond urgently. And I hope Parliament would also understand where we're coming from. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Minister, and thank you, colleagues. Um, we had encouraged the members of the media to pose questions to the chat room. We have four questions. The first one comes from Uloyolo from Business Day. The question is, what is the meaning of EAP? The second question that he's posing to us, what is the progress of the Employment Equity Amendment Bill that will allow Minister Nancy to, um, to fast track the process of transformation? Another question with no name, are we going to get the report or the copy of the report? Tandega Makatini is making a comment that it is exciting to see the report that it has adopted an intersectionality theoretical framework, which I think the chairperson will be able to comment on. So colleagues, those are the few questions that we have. And maybe the chairperson will lead us, Mr. Mkalipi, and Minister and DM will take the, the final comments on the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. In response to the first question around the EAP, the EAP is the economically active population. It is made up of people that are either in employment or those who are still actively seeking employment. And the age groups that we cover is from the ages of 16 to the ages of 64. All the people that are currently um, either employed or seeking employment within that age group. Um, so that is what EAP stands for. In terms of intersectionality, yes, we have taken on that approach. You will see that when we reflect on issues of intersectionality, we primarily cover gender and race, and we don't include disability at occupational levels because it is dismal. It, it, it's not a good reflection. And even if you tried to uh, represent it in terms of the graphs, it would be insignificant and therefore not worth talking about. And it's absolutely an area of concern for us. I hope I've answered the two questions and I'll hand over to Datem Kalipi maybe to comment on the issue of progress on, on the amendment book. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, the question on what's the progress on the bill. The bill, as the ministers indicated, is in parliament. And the, but the parliamentary process are at a very advanced stage. Uh, the committee has dealt with the bill on clause by clause. Now, the only stage that is waiting for them is them to finalize what they've agreed on on a clause by clause basis. And they are gonna be doing that within the next coming weeks. And we think parliament, and then from there, it will go to the NCOP and the committee there then will do its own processes. We very confident that the bill will be finalized by, by parliament uh, within this year. And uh, we show, we hope in crossing our fingers uh, that uh, president will be able to sign it into law early next year. But these are uh, hopes that we have. Remember, because the president will take his own time in, in, in uh, analyzing and assessing the bills. But in terms of the parliamentary process, we, we foresee it being finalized before the end of this year. Uh, the copies of, of the presentation and the, the, the report, 
the presentation, the report will be available on our website site as soon as we finalize the launch today, and it will be published in the in in, in the government uh, printers, and uh, it can be emailed to uh, all the journalists that are part of this process that were invited here. Uh, uh, the report can be emailed to them. Therefore, it is yes available. The report. Thank you, Chair. I'm in a meeting, sir. Okay. Call me. Uh, can Minister NTM to the head what, of what, what question do you want us to respond to, uh, uh, Savelo? I thought the Commissioner and uh, Mr. Mkalipi, they've taken the questions. Minister, the last question that is posed, uh, it's a comment in the chat board, if you check. And the, the summary of it indicates that, um, do you think it's possible if we're sitting at 5% that in the next 50, I mean, the next five years we'll be able to reach 50%. They just want your comment as an honorable minister. I don't want to speculate as to whether we'd be able to reach 50% or not, but I think what we should start doing is a very aggressive strategy which we must put in place. Hence, our proposals of ensuring that this becomes a compulsory. We want to do it by compulsion now. If, if people have failed to do it voluntarily. And we want also to use access to the state business or the state tenders. We think that would be able to drive the process. Of course, we are going to continue assessing the progress in relation to that. I do not want to say we will be able to reach that 50% at this stage, but uh, I think the commission once we've passed that legislation, once we've put those measures, which we are proposing, we might be able um, to fast track the process. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister and colleagues. We are coming closer to the end of the, of the, um, the briefing. But we want to encourage our colleagues that indeed, our team has uploaded the report. We have also forwarded the copies to GCIS if you are struggling um, to access in our website at www.labor.gov.za. So we are also affording the public an opportunity to raise questions where the, the chairperson of the commission and, the, and Mr. Mkalip in particular will be able to take interviews for journalists. So we're waiting for those requests so that we can explain the meaning of the, of the report to the public. Without necessarily wasting time, then let me give over to the DM to close the session of today. Over to you, DM. There's a cozy corner there. There's a cozy corner. With a hand, Sabel. Sabelo, there's a cozy corner with a hand. Proceed, proceed, go see corner. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Uh, it's Ngozi corner to my from. It's Ngozi corner to my from. Uh, seven o two. Uh, Minister, just a quick one. What are really some of the biggest hindrances when it comes to transformation in this country? Is it more on the side of, um, say, business or private entities which are resistant to change? Or is it really uh, a failure on the part of government to, uh, say, encourage and promote transformation, especially within the workplace? Okay, before Minister responds, is there another hand so that we can wrap up? Proceed, I see a hand. Proceed.
Can you respond to the question, Minister? The hand of 2774606, who is, the, who is that hand? The hand is not speaking, Minister. Oh, we oh have only the mouth is speaking, not the hand. <laughs> <laughs> well, because it's on, the, we all have to speculate, but our observation is very clear that it's resistance to change. And there's a tendency to use the issue of the skills to say uh, South Africans are not skills. Companies want to use um, their skilled people to come and drive their companies when they are here, but they do not do any training of, 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 of the South Africans to be able to take over the business. But so it's a combination of factors, but my view is very simple. It's, it's people trying to protect the privileges of the past where they do not want to open up uh, the economy. And uh, that's a matter which we have to deal with. And that's why we are saying, um, we think that if we don't compel them, we leave it to them, we make it voluntary, they are not going to be able to move. And if we come up with this, uh, with this legislation or with this amendment we are talking about, we are going to be able to compel the people to be South African because the way they are doing things, they are not South African, they just want to, to exploit, enjoy the profits, whilst the whole population or the majority of the population are not enjoying uh, the wealth of the country. So the wealth belongs to all who live in South Africa. So they must just learn that, they must accept that. And we as government must be more aggressive in driving that particular agenda. And we must not be apologetic about that. I'm not saying we must be reckless, but we must not be apologetic. There are still more hands, Sabelo. Sabelo, maybe if I can also come in from the commission perspective. Um, and respond to Ngosikona's question, uh, whether it's, it's resistance or failure on government's part. In our experience, and, and I'm talking now what we find uh, on the ground is that it is resistance. We have had, on an annual basis, we have roadshows with the department where we engage employers, where we listen to the issues, where we listen to what obstacles are there. We also encourage them to comply. We share with them how to comply. We discuss the reporting. So from our side, we're giving out education, we are educating, but it's not resulting in the desired results. Secondly, we've had engagements with employers and primarily with transformation managers and in trying to find out what the obstacles are. And what the transformation managers are telling us is that there is resistance from owners and top management to implement transformation and to make it effective. That it is not a key strategic imperative at organizational level and the goals of transformation are not put out there by the board and do not form part of a strategy of an organization in seeking to achieve that. And finally, as an incentive, and Goskona, you may be aware that in terms of the BEE legislation, and I know that uh, Commissioner Nduli is here today, in terms of BEE legislation, one of the elements of the BEE scorecard is management control. And management control really focuses on affirmative action from an EE perspective. And companies then get an incentive for complying because they score points and they get a higher rating in terms of their BEE, which enables them to compete more successfully with their, with, within their, their sectors and in their industries. So I do not believe that as government, not enough is happening to create incentives and measures for compliance. I believe we're doing enough, but I believe like the minister has said, it is a protection of privilege and, and an unwillingness to trust the other with, with, um, with organizations and the leadership, as well as decision-making in those organizations. Thank you. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, I think the last comment that we have is from Donovan, who is appreciating the insightful report and which is truly appreciated. Um, I see Ngozi Korn has asked a question, when will the report be uploaded? And we are understanding that it's uploaded now. And hence, I even said, even at CIS, we have forwarded the report to them. Uh, without necessarily wasting time, then let me allow um, DM to close the session, but also encourage our colleagues who want an insightful discussions on the matter to conduct us so that we can forward our specialists to speak and inform the public. Over to you, DM. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, um, Dr. Sabelo. Um, um, thank you, um, our chair of the session, uh, Dr. Sabelo Mali. Um, uh, allow me to acknowledge the presence of the Minister uh, of Employment and Labor, Dr. Tulas Nwesi, our minister and the chair of the commission, uh, Metabia Kabinde. Uh, all commissioners present, uh, our acting DG, all our DDGs who are present, our officials of the department, our stakeholders who have joined us, and all those who might have joined us in uh, through our um, GCIS platforms, uh, live streaming that are there, uh, guests that have been invited to this function, uh, the media, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, Chairperson, allow me first of all to acknowledge uh, the work that is done, that was done um, uh, from the fourth uh, commission um, uh, upon which the, the fifth commission uh, commenced its work and, and the report uh, which demonstrates a clear handover from commission four to commission five. And, and I think this is something uh, which I think it stands out from from this report and this uh, selfless and professionalism at the uh, commission uh, itself is a catalog of a caring government which we must all embrace and encourage for all government institutions. And we also appreciate that the annual report uh, 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 that is being presented that we are launching today uh, will be, uh, um, um, uh, it ushers in the five-year strategy for the commission itself and which will be a reflection of the annual performance plans in line with the government planning cycles. And I must say, uh, 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 Chair and Minister and, and Chairperson of the Commission, that I'm confident uh, that with the expertise uh, uh, and the high level of professionalism uh, and the clear commitment to, to transformation of the, low, uh, of the labor market, we are slowly turning the corner. And much as we appreciate that the struggle is, is far from over, uh, we are encouraged by the Commission's uh, commitment to the key strategic objectives that aim to improve the challenges of our diverse nation uh, in the workplaces. And we must also remain focused and unapologetic in our quest to promoting uh, equity in the labor market. And it's about time that we started uh, executing our policies and face the consequences of our decisions, Minister and the chair of the commission. And this will, uh, we will achieve through the commission uh, providing expert advice to the minister uh, on policy related matters and through stakeholder engagements. And the time has come uh, when we no longer have to engage in endless consultations and negotiations, but to implement the policies that will uh, better the lives of our people by addressing some of these disparities that are very glaring. And there is a very loud, uh, spontaneous outbursts and outpourings uh, of affection and support and very strong emotions expressed uh, in this annual report. And there is so much consistency uh, from the chair uh, of the commission to all commissioners, uh, but most importantly, from one commission to the other, this is very commendable, which means the work that we have been doing, it, it, it flows and it, it is, uh, um, uh, we see uh, uh, consistency in the work that was done by the previous commission, including the work that has been done by this new commission that is doing this work. So it can be, uh, and I think we must agree, uh, Minister, that it can be that, uh, and I agree with you, Minister, that uh, for 26 years in democracy and over 21 reports, 
and for the terms of offices of a total of five uh, commissions. We keep talking about employers who don't comply uh, with our regulations. I think it's high time uh, we have allowed this phenomenon to carry on for far too long and we have consulted extensively and we have been very kind to men for many years uh, with most of the employers. And I agree with the minister that something has to give, something has to happen. And I think uh, we need to tighten up our compliance uh, checks and make sure that checks and balances and make sure that we do uh, uh, this, uh, we, we, we actually pounce on some of these uh, non-compliant <laughs> employers. Uh, we are hoping that some employers will find it in them to be patriotic citizens, but, uh, but it has uh, become clearer to us that we must legislate and enforce uh, coercively, which is not something very good, but we have to do something about it. And this uh, annual report is a call for drast drastic action, and we must never apologize for doing right by our people. Uh, Minister, we must never submit ourselves to employers who reject transformation, and yet they continue to do business with the state. And I think the recommendations are very clear that if you don't comply, you cannot continue to benefit. You can't have your, want to have your cake and eat it, or want to have your bread buttered both sides. So uh, I think uh, action, we need to be decisive uh, about some of the actions that we have taken and the policies that we are making. Uh, we need just to do implementation. And this has to come to an end, and it has to come to an end right now. But allow me, Chair, to thank uh, 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 the, 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 the minister for uh, minister's visionary uh, leadership for having been there uh, throughout the processes uh, for his steadfastness and his guidance to the commission itself and the commissioners themselves. But also allow me to thank the, uh, the, the, the commission itself for this telling work that they have done and uh, which is led by a capable chairperson, Meta Bea Kabinde. We want to take this opportunity to thank you heartily for the work that you have put uh, together to produce uh, this report. We, 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 think, uh, we thank you so much for, for this work. We know that uh, it has not been an easy work um, uh, uh, for you to have to go through all the statistics and make sure that you are able to give the country uh, this scenario that we find ourselves that it can't just be business as usual that uh, uh, our people, those who rightfully deserve to be in certain positions are still lagging behind. It can't be right but thank you so much and all the team that has been behind the scenes because sometimes we forget to thank them the team that has been behind the scenes doing all the preparations of this uh, launch and the sabello as the chair i thank you heartily because i know you are so passionate about what you do and we normally forget to thank those who are steering the ship we want to thank you um, heartily on behalf of myself and the minister and the department that uh, you are doing a good job and those who are behind the scenes who have been helping you, your team. We want to thank you and the team of the GCIS that has been helping us. Bonda de Mkalipi who have been behind the scenes and oh, everybody who have been doing this to make sure that this event becomes the success that it is. We want to thank you so much and thank you uh, for your audience. I thank you. Deputy Minister, I'm sorry for interrupting Savel. One journalist uh, whilst interviewing me uh, said, why should we praise you? Why should we praise the, commend the, the fish for swimming when it's you doing your job? Okay, thank you, Savel. Thank you, Minister. <laughs> I know, I know, <laughs> but we are doing a good job and we must say it unapologetically. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, GM. Thank you, colleagues, DG. And thank you, Mr. Seafield, for leading the team. And of course, this is not the last platform. We encourage the members of the media to, to be in touch with us so that we can explain to the public the work that we're doing as government. Thank you very much, colleagues, and have an a good weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff.